Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to AI for Good. My name is Matthias Greschel from the ITU. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Tech Communication Technologies and the organizer of AI for Good. AI for Good is an initiative of ITU along with 37 sister United Nations agencies and co-convened by Switzerland to see how artificial intelligence can help achieve the sustainable development goals. I have the immense privilege of introducing today's session as part of the AI and climate science webinar series, Climate Informatics, Machine Learning for the Study of Climate Change. Everyone is invited to use the Q&A functionality to ask away during the, the talk, and you can find the button at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to ask short questions, which will make it easier for the moderators to navigate. The session today will be moderated by Duncan watson Paris and Philip Steer, who are both affiliated with the Department of Physics at the University of Oxford. Philip Steer is a professor of atmospheric physics and head of atmospheric, oceanic and planetary physics at Oxford. Philip, if you could introduce your co-moderator and then please take it away from there. Thank you. Great, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so we're really excited to kick off this session. The chairing today will be Duncan watson Paris, who is a senior researcher here in Oxford. And I'll just pass on straight to you, Duncan. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Philip. Yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce this session on climate informatics, um, machine learning for the study of climate change. Um, I think without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, so Claire Monteleone, who, um, so she obtained a, her bachelor's in earth sciences from Harvard before then making the switch to computer science and obtaining her doctorate at MIT, uh, and then holding positions at the University of Paris-Saclay, George Washington and Columbia Universities. Um, and since 2018 has been a professor at the University of Colorado, Bol Colorado Boulder. Um, so made the uh, the transition from, from Earth systems and uh, to computer science back again. But most pertinently, co-founded co the Climate Informatics Workshop uh, 10 years ago now, long before many of us were, were really thinking about the opportunities that existed at this, this interface. So I'm really looking forward to hearing her unique perspective on uh, machine learning for climate. Um, take it over, take it away, Claire. Um, thank you so much, Duncan, and thanks for the Im invitation. So we study climate informatics due to the threat of climate change and the extreme events we've been seeing, including me mega storms um, and, of course, drought leading to wildfire, um, so heat waves leading to wildfire and drought and their threats to communities and ecosystems. Um, and climate informatics is based on the vision that machine learning can shed light on climate change. Um, now, as uh, Duncan mentioned, we all already have some significant critical mass in the area. Um, so Gavin, who's speaking next, and I launched the first climate informatics workshop in New York City um, a decade ago. And um, then the workshop had its 10th year um, over at Oxford, of course, that was online. Um, some items to note, we recently um, kicked off a hackathon and we'll, results will be forthcoming on three topics. Um, and then we're having an international conference um, on machine learning for climate at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. And then next climate informatics um, will be in spring, date TBD, but hopefully at the NOAA Center for Climate Data in North Carolina. Um, and I also wanted to mention that we're now at a stage where we have a journal um, and most people on this call that are publishing in some realm of AI for the sustainable development goals of the UN would be very welcome to submit. Um, so, you know, Looking back when we started trying to rile up the AI and machine learning community around climate change back in 2014, um, Arindam Banerjee and I tried to outline in a tutorial the areas where we thought machine learning um, could have a significant impact. Um, so, you know, there's certainly a, a sparsity in the paleo or past climate record. Um, although we do have certain longstanding sources such as, you know, tree rings, corals, et cetera, that are sparse geographically. And so we thought that that could be a, a data problem to which AI could be applied. 
In green are things that my group has worked on, um, and I'm not gonna talk about all of them. I'm gonna talk a bit about climate downscaling, um, getting from modeling perspective, which is very uh, coarse scale generally in terms of spatial resolution down to local forecasts. Um, Gavin and I did our first paper on looking at the output of ensembles of physics-driven climate models, such as the ensemble that informs the IPCC, um, and then using AI along with past observations to try to robustify the ensemble forecast. That's been a whole line of work in my research group um, that I'm not going to cover today, but um, for climate modeling questions and how um, ML can be applied, um, Gavin will be speaking next. Um, all of these questions are of a spatiotemporal nature. And you know it's challenging for standard AI because now you have data that's not independently identically distributed. Um, we see nonlinearities and and long term dependency over both space and time. Um, and specifically, if we think about where we have consensus in this scientific community, it's around trends and averages. But there's a lot of uncertainty in the tail. So even if there's global warming. What are we going to see in terms of extremes? And this becomes especially um, a harder question to answer as we go to regional scales. Um, so, you know, it was early days. We were trying to map out possible areas. And since then, we've seen papers and um, conferences emerge and address a lot of other areas. Um, so for those of you on the call that came here because you do AI for good, um, I would encourage you to, to actually specifically work on climate change um, as you could have a lot of impact. Um, but today in this um, short talk before our discussion, I wanted to focus on um, methods, unsupervised deep learning methods um, that I hope will free up practitioners to not need uh, labeled data. And we'll do so in a few case studies. Um, one on avalanche detection and one a general downscaling task applied to temperature and precipitation. Um, so a quick technical slide to front load um, my take home message. But again, if this is, you know, if you're not really on the technical side, um, we'll motivate through the case studies afterwards. Um, but just to make a distinction, when we do deep learning, typically we're going to have some architecture, some deep network. Um, and that's going to have parameters that I'm just referring to as W, so many, many parameters. Um, but we'll, at, we'll denote the action of this network on an input data, say an image or a, you know, a matrix of, say, temperature in some particular region. Um, and then we'll denote the output after running the input through all the linearities and nonlinearities in a deep network. Uh, we'll denote that y hat. And then what is learning? Learning is the process of taking many uh, sort of ground truth labeled data points where we have a desired output y without the hat for a particular input. And we want to try to push um, the output of the network as close as possible to the correct label for each data point. So we write down some loss function um, or an objective function that we want to minimize. Um, and then we're just going to essentially do um, some form of gradient descent on that objective function. And then via the chain rule, we can push back into all the different layers of the network what their um, local update needs to be of that parameter as we, we take steps along this objective function. Um, that's supervised deep learning in a nutshell. And the issue that I'm trying to address today is that that requires a label, meaning for an input, we have some desired target output and paired data like that is great and really valuable and often hard to come by this ground truth sort of gold standard data. But say you don't have that, you're a practitioner that has a lot of um, data that hasn't been labeled. Um, sorry, um, you should still be able to proceed in a pretty similar way. Um, the only difference is that when you design your loss function, it can't depend on some external piece of information, some label. 
It could only depend on um, you know, things that you have access to, namely the input and the output of the network. So I still have some network here with weights. I'll, now I'll call the output x hat. And so you can have a loss function that tries to draw these two close together. I'll talk about approaches for that in a second where ultimately what we're trying to do is extract interesting features um, in sort of a dimensionality reduction setting. Um, as a side note though, for those interested in say a clustering task, as soon as you use either the whole training data set as your batch size or any mini batch size greater than one, you can typically write down clustering objectives here and then basically um, do gradient descent on your objective to optimize that. So in both cases, you're doing gradient descent on your objective, you're using the train rule to update your parameters. Um, and so you just wanna think about, is there an objective I can write down even without a label why that is sensible? Um, and so let me go relatively briefly through a couple of case studies. Um, so in avalanche detection, um, it was a de detection task, which is ultimately supervised. So our entire pipeline we call semi-supervised, but we tried to put um, most of the learning in the unsupervised part. Um, and this, this follows a line of work around extremes that my group has been interested in, both completely general unsupervised methods to even define extremes in a soft probabilistic way when you have multiple variables, you don't wanna do thresholding and you want to learn your signature for various extremes from data um, to work on hurricane track and intensity forecasting using track data and different um, fields of interest centered around the track um, and now, um, or in this paper, Avalanche. Um, and this was published in um, the proceedings of the 2020 Climate Informatics, um, led by um, Somia, my current PhD student, and Sophie, who's now a researcher um, in France, but did a postdoc here. Um, so there is, you know, the human safety aspect of avalanches. Um, and then there's also the climate change impact aspect that we need to learn more by being able to detect um, avalanches and see how they're changing. Um, from a machine learning perspective, so avalanches are rare, um, and that means there's class imbalance. So if you take avalanche as your, your positive label and no avalanche as negative, then you're gonna have what imbalance with more negative examples. Um, and then we were working with a real ground truth data set actually collected on the ground by people trekking into certain regions in the Alps to measure if there had been avalanche deposits. Um, and so certainly this is, you know, dangerous and, and costly to obtain. Um, so in this study, we worked with Meteo France and had um, the ground truth survey in certain and avalanche corridors in the French Alps. Um, and we also had as much um, synthetic aperture radiation data as we wanted from the Sentinel missions. Um, but keep in mind, there's no middle ground in this project where you would have annotated or segmented images of SAR that had been labeled by humans. Um, so at the time that we were talking to them, it was a hard task when you're just looking at SAR of snow to detect avalanche deposits, even for the human eye. Um, and so this is just where ground truth was collected on the ground, but is limited. And then you have your satellite imagery. Um, so uh, one, um, so let, let me walk through the first approach, which kind of forms the basis for our approach, but the first version is sort of a straw man. So, in either case, we're, we're doing anomaly detection um, because avalanches are rare. Um, and you could train an unsupervised model um, to represent the distribution of negative examples, such as a VAE. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, now you have a model of you know, images that don't have avalanche deposits in them. Um, and these images pretty much were just snow images with either avalanche or no avalanche. So if you have an unlabeled image and it um, is not very well reconstructed 
by the VAE that was trained on non-avalanche images, um, then you might want to classify it as an avalanche, which means you some, need some kind of threshold on the reconstruction error. Um, ah, so let's just look at where labeled data is needed. Definitely in either approach, you need labeled data in item three because the threshold is a hyperparameter. And so you'd need to tune that threshold on images where you know whether or not they had an avalanche in them. So you'd need to you know, filter your images um, by correlating them with the, the ground truth survey. But in this straw man version, you would also need to do the same before item two, because you need a set of only negative examples to train on. So um, we don't want to waste that ground truth data to prepare for two. So we would actually change, um, make a change to item two, which is that we'll learn an unsupervised model on all the data without having filtered out for um, whether the um, data is negative or positive. Um, that's kind of the punchline of our approach and it actually works um, better than sort of the straw man approach. Um, but I'll go a little bit into the technicalities. I know people on the call have different levels of expertise. Um, so um, just a quick review on an autoencoder. This is what's called a pretext task and a rather stupid one because you're essentially learning a noisy identity function because you're trying to push the input, um, so, sorry, the output of the network to be similar to the input of the network. Um, the weights, the W that I showed are sort of are learned in, in these blocks. Um, why would you wanna do this silly pretext task? Well, after getting a model that has been trained on a lot of data and you did gradient descent to make the input as uh, output as close to the input, you'll get um, a, a representation of the input distribution. And if you sent um, the data through a, a narrow bottleneck, meaning lower dimension than the input, then you'll have a compressed representation. You can view that as dimensionality reduction or feature extraction. Um, indicated here, we often call that a latent representation. Um, quickly, I'll mention that in cognitive science applications, you might want to go through a wide layer. So you might want to project to a higher dimensional space um, because there's evidence that in various cognitive systems in humans and animals, we like to have sparse representations for different signals to, um, to distinguish them. Um, and you can either get one latent representation, so vanilla autoencoder, but these days people would like um, to have richer models. So we'd like to have actually a distribution over latent representations. Um, so the standard VAE would learn a Gaussian distribution. So um, the parameters will be estimated to um, specialize away from the prior to represent a distribution over um, the latent space for the data that you've been trained on. Um, and in the next project, I'll talk about how do you get away from the Gaussian. Um, so let me just go through the straw man approach and then the, the twist that we propose. So the first approach would say that um, we'd have to take our satellite data um, compared to the ground truth survey to create um, patches that we know don't contain avalanche. And then we train the autoencoder, which is here, only from the negative examples. Um, the other approach that we're pushing is to really lean on unsupervised learning. So just take patches from all the data without having had to do any looking at the ground truth survey yet and learn your autoencoder. So those are two alternate versions for step two. But in either case, um, after that, um, there is the, the hyperparameter tuning and the hyperparameter is the threshold on reconstruction error. So how does this work? You just give input um, patches into your trained autoencoder, but then um, computing a reconstruction error that compares the output of the network to the input of the network um, we then consult the label and try to make all the avalanche um, 
labeled points be above some threshold and all the no avalanche or as many as possible below this threshold. And this allows us to find the knee in the curve, um, which will be that threshold. This of course has to be on a labeled data set that is held out the validation set that won't be used again for test. Um, what is the testing pipeline or the um, anomaly detection pipeline? So an unlabeled image um, is, is fed to the trained um, VAE and the tuned threshold is used to, um, to determine whether it's an avalanche by comparing its, um, by looking at the reconstruction error between the output and the input of the network. Okay. So at the time, um, our Meteor France collaborators had done a non-AI approach where you would um, threshold some deterministic um, function that could be computed from the SAR imagery, but um, this is not considered to be very helpful to have little tiny avalanches here and there, like inside the ski town. Um, so admittedly, it was a low bar, but a highly difficult task. You'll see that in general, um, the none of the methods perform very good. The baseline was getting about um, 0.58 accuracy. Um, and we had done in previous work a method using deep learning, um, but it was supervised using convolutional neural network. Um, and so, you know, we had to artificially balance the data set and that decreased the data size since there are so few positive examples. And that did actually worse than the baseline. Um, but both the, so both of our pipelines ultimately are semi-supervised because there's that supervised step at the end comparing to a threshold. Um, but the training of the VAE could have even, either been done with only neg negative examples or just with all the data. Um, in both cases, we got a, a, a lift, but we got a more significant lift when we trained the VAE on all the data. So no supervision at the beginning to know that we were only training on negative examples. Um, so this seems counterintuitive at first, but um, the unsupervised approach gets to train on more data, which we generally um, correlate with better generalization and a higher diversity of data because now, you know, your feature space includes images that have some avalanche deposits in them, which we can kind of view as training on, um, a more diverse or more sort of noisy data, um, which helps us to generalize. And the, the key intuition there is to remember that to the extent that any of these algorithms had hyperparameters, and in this case, it was specifically the threshold above which you classify as avalanche, those hyperparameters are tuned to be optimal for each method on the held out validation set. So between these two, the value of the threshold could be different. But since this was trained on a more diverse data set, we conjecture that it's generalizing um, better. Um, and these sort of hold up as you look at um, some ROC curves that the, the fully unsupervised VAE learning um, in your semi-supervised pipeline is is best. So um, as a sort of take home message for my AI folks on the call, um, this is a semi-supervised approach to detecting rare events when the labeled data is limited, um, where our thesis is that you want to lean heavily onto your unsupervised learning and only use your labeled data for hyperparameter tuning. Um, for the domain experts in the crowd, you can kind of view this as learning a virtual sensor. We don't want to keep sending humans into dangerous avalanche corridors. And so can we use a machine learning model now that um, you know maps between SAR and the ground truth human survey? And then in other regions, we could use it um, to, to sort of predict um, where we may have where there might be deposits. Um, and then in, in both cases, this is a detection task and what needs to happen more in that community is forecasting. I'm gonna transition to um, an uh, unsupervised pipeline for downscaling where my understanding of why it works so well has to do with some self-supervisory signal in the data. 
Um, so Brian is now in Germany doing a PhD um, um, at Alf Alfred Wegener um, in a climate group, um, but he did his thesis here and also interned at Jupiter Intelligence. Um, and he was interested in downscaling, which comes a lot up a lot in climate and meteorology. Um, to differentiate in AI, we might talk about up sampling or super resolution. So the down and up is reversed. One thing Gavin and I learned at the very beginning of climate informatics endeavor is how much jargon needs to be redefined across fields. And that's interesting when you bring AI into any domain is to um, be very <laughs> careful about the terminology. Um, but downscaling in this domain is using coarser scale spatiotemporal data to try to infer finer scale um, fields of the same variable. Um, if you look at statistical downscaling, um, from an AI perspective, it, it involves supervised learning, meaning that you need a lot of paired maps so consider temperature. If I have a coarse resolution map, um, I would need the corresponding fine resolution map. And I'd need many, many such paired maps in order to train the methods that we found in that literature. Also, we found that they were providing point predictions. Now, of course, that's a bit misleading. It's a whole grid of predictions at the finer scale, but you'll get one map right per per input at the coarser scale once the model is trained, as opposed to a distribution over maps. And um, so generative here refers to the AI definition is that we'd like um, a probabilistic model that gives us a distribution over um, downscaled images. Um, and this also came out in last CI. Um, and Brian's idea was to use this emerging idea of domain alignment in deep unsupervised learning um, and apply some recent at the time um, methods. Um, and I'll go into that shortly, but first the punchline is that it worked. So he obtained a generative model um, for downscaling. It worked for temperature, precipitation. It's actually uh, kind of symmetric. So you can do upscaling as well. Um, but my understanding about why it worked had to do with the self-supervision is that we never trained with any paired images, but all the images had the same bounding box. You know, we did studies on the continental US and since the bounding boxes were aligned, and of course we know that the underlying physical processes that result in temperature and precipitation um, depend on their actual geographic location. I think that's um, the alignment that gave what we call a self-supervisory signal and allowed these methods to perform so well. So I'm cognizant of time. Um, I know it's nearly 9.30, but in terms of when I started, I do believe I have five minutes. So I'm gonna quickly um, go through this idea um, and then leave time for Gavin and for uh, at least half an hour of discussion. Um, so, we did, we learned separate models for temperature downscaling and precipitation downscaling. And our training data, we needed um, coarse resolution data and fine resolution data in, in, both, in both types of variables, temperature and precipitation. Um, now for our training, we didn't need paired images, but I just wanna tell you the coarse resolution data um, we just used some reanalysis data um, and the fine resolution data we actually used from NWP models. Um, now this is interesting. Um, it shows that as far as AI is concerned, the methods don't care where the data comes from. If you ask a climate scientist why we do downscaling, it's because we wanna go from climate model scale or regional climate model scale uh, projections to um, much finer spatial resolution. Well, in our case, reanalysis data is basically observation data smoothed um, through some, some physical processes, process models. Um, but that was our coarse resolution data was actually from observations and our, our fine resolution at one eighth degree square um, lat lawn was actually from NWP. So it doesn't really matter. And the data is not generated from the same um, source. Um, domain alignment 
um, given two random variables, and let's forget that earlier we said X would be the example, Y would be the label. Now just X and Y are two random variables. Um, we'll think of it as say temperature at coarse scale and temperature at fine scale. We want to learn an invertible mapping so that if I take um, IID samples of the marginal distribution of one random variable X, apply F, I can approximate the marginal of Y. And if I take IID samples from the marginal of Y and apply F inverse, I can approximate the marginal of X. Um, and so the idea in this align flow paper that we appealed to is that, I mean, what do we want ideally? We want some shared latent space some um, to learn some joint distribution over X and Y. Um, and so we do this um, by making a conditional independence assumption that there's this latent space Z such that um, the two variables X and Y are conditionally independent given Z. Um, because of course that gives us a, an easier way to factor um, our joint over all three, then we can integrate out the latent space and essentially have the joint. How we get these conditional probability distributions? Um, well, we're gonna talk about normalizing flows shortly um, where you need some prior on your latent space, but then you complicate your, your posterior over the latent space given um, training data. But the main take home message of why this is unsupervised is that the training data needed is just IID samples from X. So say core scale, IID samples from Y, fine scale of the same variable, but not paired, um, paired images. Um, and so normalizing flows are this idea that, okay, we like the idea of VAE, but we'd like to not only have to be constrained to learn a Gaussian. So you could start with a simple prior, say a Gaussian or uniform, and then um, compose a bunch of functions so that you can complicate it more and more from the prior, but these have to be invertible. And then in the deep learning, we'll learn parameters of these various functions. Um, so ultimately we're gonna learn flows between one domain and the latent space and the other domain and the same latent space Z. Um, that's the, the punchline of this sort of complicated figure from aligned flow. Um, what's important to note is that the only thing that we're learning are the parameters of these flows. So invertible mappings between one domain and the latent space, the other domain and the latent space. If say X is our course resolution domain, we are gonna have to upsample it to represent it at the same dimension as Y because we'll just have the latent space be the same dimension, but we do it um, by just looking at neighboring cells and adding as, as um, little information as possible. Um, oh, and Brian modified standard aligned flow to use um, GLOW, which uses one by one invertible convolutions. Um, so the quantitative experiments, and this is just one page of Brian's thesis where he also did a lot of ClimDex indices, but to do quantitative quantitative comparisons in a field where we weren't aware of any other generative um, downscaling methods, we had to compare A on point predictions only and B compared to supervised methods. So BCSD was sort of state-of-the-art downscaling methods in domain. CNN was by um, Banyo Medina in the previous climate informatics. And those are both supervised, meaning they need paired images at high, at coarse and fine resolution. And you know, we wouldn't expect the unsupervised method to outperform them. It generally performs comparably. But the special sauce that we now bring is the generative um, abilities. And let's sort of showcase that at least qualitatively. So if we're looking at precipitation and we're given a coarse scaled image from our training data for which, um, you know, if, if so if we do have paired images for test, this would be the, the image paired to it, which is not given uh, to the model. The model um, produces this precipitation map, but then you can also sample as much as you want conditionally on this image and get a whole sort of ensemble of sampled um, precipitation maps, um, which might um, you know, give a, a richer um, 
a richer interpretation to domain experts. You can also do these interpretability studies that are really big in machine learning right now, where we want to interpolate in our latent space Z. So the latent space Z has to kind of bridge between the two real domains and does not have clear interpretability as such. But as we walk through the latent space, we can generate images at both course and fine resolution. And in this example, we actually only looked at fine resolution at the two endpoints in at two different times, mapped them to late to the latent space so we could general, uh, generate a course resolution at each of those times. And then depending on how you walk through the latent space, which now is a whole literature in itself in AI, at each point that you sample in the latent space, you can um, you can push through the flow to get a, a fine grain resolution and push through the other direction flow to get a coarse resolution. Um, okay, I know I need to wrap up. Um, I thought it might be interesting to talk about some remaining challenges. You know, some of them we've addressed. Um, you know, I've pushed in this talk to use unsupervised learning since there's often going to be very limited label data. Um, and showed an approach, you know, with extreme class imbalance, since a lot of us are going to be studying extreme events now to get a, a grip on how to um, adapt to climate change. Um, there's also just this, um, there's no counterfactual Earth issue is that we have one time series. So I'm looking for ways that we can actually study, uh, substitute the massive um, granularity and diversity of data we have over location as some kind of proxy for what we're lacking in um, our temporal record. Um, we talked about scale resolution challenges. I'm thinking Gavin might mention also issues inside a climate model around that, such as parameterization. Um, one thing my group has pushed a lot on is the non-stationary aspect. We have change in, in, the, in the phrase climate change. So we have to get away from IID. If we think of RMSE, it relies on IID. Even CRPS to evaluate probabilistic forecasts, forecasts has a CDF in it and, and thus um, has some IID assumptions. And then of course, interpretability. Um, another big thrust in my group is how do you evaluate um, probabilistic um, models such as generative models, including GANs. And, um, and then there's the AI to ES community that's totally built on trying to make AI more trustworthy when it comes to things like extreme storms. So thanks very much. Um, of course, I wanna plug some resources and I'll um, hand the floor back to Philip. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Claire, for a really interesting talk. I should say we will take questions at the end, so please feel free to put questions in the Q&A box, and we will take all questions in the end to trigger some discussion. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Gavin Schmidt. Uh, so Gavin has a mathematics background, actually, with an undergraduate degree from a university called Oxford, and then he did a PhD in applied mathematics at UCL in London. And then went on to really develop key model components of the NASAGIS climate model, and now serves as the director of NASAGIS since 2014. He's also since February the acting senior climate advisor to the NASA administrator. And he works on quite a wide range of topics of, of past, present, and future climate with a very distinguished track record. Without trying to embarrass him much further, he's, he's uh, also received the American uh, Geophysical Union Climate Communication Prize and as a fellow of AGU and AAAS. But without further uh, delays, I'll just hand over to Gavin and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Philip. Can you hear me? Yep. Loud and clear. Okay, great. Let me just uh, share my slides. So thank you very much to Claire for the uh, for the great introduction to uh, to machine learning in 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 in, uh, in general uh, in general ways. Um, I'm going to talk um, much more um, uh, it, with the specific goal of uh, thinking about how machine learning is going to help us or, and is helping us uh, in climate modeling uh, and and what are the challenges and, and potentials uh, that we have there. 
So uh, just to give you an outline of my talk so that, uh, you know, if you get bored, you can just, uh, you can just, just go away and, and come back to the end. Um, the, the first thing I, I want to demonstrate to you is that Earth system models um, have demonstrated skill in predictions and are continuing to improve their representations uh, of the climate. Um, you sometimes hear that, uh, that these models are no use at all or that they are very poor skill or they can't do certain things. Um, that may have been true in the past, but the uh, but the current generation of Earth system models is uh, are extremely skillful um, and have great representations for for many 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 aspects of the climate system. There are, of course, many issues that remain um, at the level of fundamental processes, the very, very small scale, subgrid scale um, uh, processes in clouds, aerosols, uh, in the land surface. Um, all of those things uh, are still uh, testing us uh, when it comes to uh, including them in simulations. And many important Earth system processes uh, are not yet incorporated uh, into these models. And, and I'll give you some examples uh, of those uh, later on. So, so we still have uncertainty and we still have incompleteness. Uh, and yet these models are still uh, skillful. I think I, I would like you to, to hold that uh, in your mind. Machine learning as a tool uh, has the potential to improve these models uh, uh, across all of those different um, uh, current uh, challenging areas. Um, but they aren't going to supplant the models and uh, sometimes people talk about machine learning as this is this magic thing that's just going to mean that we don't need to worry about physics we don't need to worry about processes uh, that is not the case uh, where machine learning uh, really has the potential to improve uh, model simulations and predictions um, is is where it's tied very very closely uh, to the physics of the system um and, and I think and I think it's true to say that people have been thinking about machine learning and climate models for for quite a number of years. And the number of useful applications, as opposed to the number of things that have been published, um, has, has yet been small. Um, and, and I'd like to kind of go into uh, that a little bit later as we uh, as this talk progresses. So where did we start? Right, and I think it's important that we understand the context and the history of climate modeling uh, before we see a little bit where it's going. Uh, so this is a, a Fortran punch card um, that was uh, that was used at GIS um, in the uh, in the 1970s, um, uh, and each uh, each punch card is is one line of code, um, and you know, and each set of, of of cards is one subroutine. You had to put it into the machine, and uh, and it took you know it it, it took hours. To, to put in a, uh, uh, a program, it took uh, months to calculate the answer, and it took a long time to print out the answer. There were no, there were no, uh, there were no screens. Um, everything was uh, was done via printouts. Um, and I and I raise this, and I and, and I and I show you this um, to demonstrate that that while the mechanisms of how we do climate modeling have radically changed, you know, obviously we are now using uh, supercomputers, though these were the supercomputers of their day. Uh, our ability to do calculations is, is, is uh, many, many orders of magnitude more uh, capable than it was then. Uh, but we're still using the same basic ideas. You know, um, I, we, we don't use this particular subroutine anymore, but uh, we're still using Fortran. Um, it's a very, very capable language and uh, very, very straightforward for, for scientists to, uh, to work with. Uh, we still organize the models in very similar ways as they were organized uh, way back in the 1970s. Uh, but what happened uh, since then? Uh, obviously, we, we have made climate predictions, right? And so, so this is, uh, you know, one of the very earliest climate predictions uh, that was published in 1981. Uh, so that's 40 years ago. And, uh, and you can see it slightly underestimated how warm the, the climate was going to get by 2020. Um, uh, going back, uh, go, going a little bit forward, this was the 1984 was the first 
um, uh, GCM uh, that, that you would recognize uh, used in a transient way. And that's uh, also uh, extremely skillful compared to uh, what was available uh, in 1984. Um, in 2000, the models were, uh, there were a lot more models, there were a lot more uh, complications in those models, but you can see that those models are actually still producing a very, very good estimate of what actually happened uh, since those models were run. Um, and, and we update this, uh, this procedure every so often, the 2005 models, similarly uh, skillful. Uh, so these, these models are able to, to capture what is actually happening. That, that's, that's very important to know. Um, but the process by which these models have developed is also very uh, interesting. And, and it's been a process of assimilation. Right. So, so back in the 1960s and 70s, climate models basically had, had atmospheric uh, components, atmospheric dynamics, atmospheric radiation, very simple oceans. The oceans got more complicated. Then we realized we needed to think about sea ice and the Arctic. And then we put in things like um, aerosols uh, as, as, as well as greenhouse gases, biogeochemical cycles, atmospheric chemistry, incorporating what's happening in the stratosphere, dust and spray, sea spray spray and salt and other kinds of compositional things, interactive vegetation, all of these things had independent groups who were looking at these things. Uh, and those, their insights, their, their results, their models have slowly been incorporated into uh, global scale climate models uh, over time. And, and the last um, uh, the, the last uh, couple of things that have been included, uh, things like dynamic ice sheets uh, for, for modeling um, uh, Antarctica or Greenland uh, and marine ecosystems to, to get uh, a, a sense of how carbon dioxide is interfering or, or interacting with, uh, with ocean circulations and ocean biogeochemistry. Uh, those, are, those are effectively brand new um, in, the, in these models. And they are, they're not in all the models, uh, but they are becoming more, uh, more, um, uh, more uh, uh, featured, if you like. Um, uh, but we're not we're not really done, right? So th there's a number of things that we still that we still don't have, and I'll give you some examples of that in a second. One of the things that we have done, though, as a community, uh, and this is a little bit of jargon, so I apologize uh, for that, is that uh, since the 1990s, uh, we have uh, had a number of what are called model into comparison projects. So, um, you know, back in the 1980s, there were only two models, uh, uh, but in the 1990s, there were, there were a dozen. Um, and now there are maybe 50 or so uh, models that are being worked on currently uh, that are being used, for instance, in the last uh, IPCC report that just came out um, at the beginning of August. Um, and these, these, these model into comparison projects, uh, what, what they do is that they give these models uh, standard experiments to run, so standard numerical simulations, uh, so that we can compare one model with another without having to worry too much about uh, exactly uh, how, what that model experiment was. So, so things like you know doubling of carbon dioxide or or running you know the historical period as as best as we understand it, um, and that gives us a way of benchmarking these models uh, for skill for completeness. Um, um, at each of these, uh, at each of these uh, um, uh, points, um, and I'll show you some results uh, from that in a second. So uh, here we have um, a, a kind of arbitrary, but it doesn't really matter so much, uh, estimate of how accurate models are, right? So, uh, so this is a, a skill score, if you like. Um, uh, if if you're all the way to the uh, to the right, then that's that's not very much skill. And if you're all the way uh, to the left, then that's quite high skill. Um, and what you're seeing is three generations uh, of models. Um, so CMIP three goes back to the uh, uh, to, to the early two thousands. 
Um, and you can see that there, there is a wide range of skill in the models. Like the worst models are much worse than, than the best models. Um, uh, and uh, But over time, uh, you can see that the worst models are kind of fading out uh, and the best models are getting better. Um, and as a whole, uh, each iteration, each generation of model has higher skill. Now, this is just looking at uh, temperature and precipitation fields, uh, but you, you could do this for, for any uh, particular uh, metric that you cared about, whether it was uh, clouds or um, uh, top of the atmosphere radiation or uh, winds or uh, sea surface temperatures or whatever it was. Uh, and you would see something very, very similar. Um, there is a spread of skill in the models, uh, but over time, uh, the model ensemble um, is, is getting better. So the best models are getting uh, better and the worst models are either being abandoned or fixed. Um, and that's that's very important to know. Um, when it comes to things that, that you might uh, care about, uh, specifically, um, uh, you might care about, for instance, how well the models uh, do the teleconnections uh, from when there's an El Nino event in the tropical Pacific. So, so what are the how how, do, how does how does the models pattern of the response to that match up with the actual response that you see? In the real world, um, and this is uh, this is uh, again three generations of models, um, and the and this is a skill score. But but this way, like one is 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 would be perfect skill, zero would be no skill. Uh, and you can see from the light blue to the red to the dark blue uh, that effectively the skill scores are increasing over time. So what that tells us is that we are capturing more of the real processes that are happening in, in, in ways that are um, uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, clear. Uh, and, and some of this is resolution, uh, you know, more and smaller grid cells. Uh, some of it is better parameterizations. Some of it is model tuning so that you can, you know, you try and get the best model that you can playing with the small degrees of freedom that you have. Um, and uh, but we're seeing we're, we're seeing things even even things that we don't tune for we're seeing greater skill uh, over time. But that doesn't mean that all the models are converging. And in this latest uh, exercise, what's what's been called CMIP six, um, something rather odd happened, um, and and that is that the spread of this value here, which is which is called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So this is how warm the planet gets if you double carbon dioxide. Um, and that's been a standard measure of, uh, of climate model. It's been a standard metric of climate models uh, since, since the very beginning of climate modeling. The uh, spread in this value, uh, instead of converging as the models got better, uh, in this particular iteration ha has increased. Um, and, and before it, it went from about two degrees to about four and a half degrees. Um, and now it goes from about 1.8 degrees uh, to more than six degrees. Uh, and that's, that's, that's very concerning. Um, uh, what's happening, it turns out, is, is it's related to uh, uncertainties in cloud modeling, uh, particularly the, uh, the phase of clouds. Um, we could get into that if people uh, want to know about that a little bit more. Um, but 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 it but it's very concerning because this this climate sensitivity number um, is really you know the thing that that controls how warm we're going to get by you know 2050 or 2100. Um, and so if it was true that uh, that our understanding of this value had 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 got worse, right? We think that it's around three degrees, but but if it really could be true that it was near six degrees, then that you'd expect basically twice as much warming uh, to come than, than we had been uh, anticipating before. And so this is this is a very concerning result. Um, uh, but it but what it what it what it tells us uh, is that we're still kind of getting ahead of the observations in terms of what we're putting into the models, right? So if the observations were so good that we understood everything about the processes that we're including, one would anticipate that the models would converge on a uh, particular uh, number that was the right number. Um, but where, as you increase 
the uh, the number of degrees of freedom in the models and the and it's the and the model output increases in spread, then that means that, that it's not sufficiently constrained uh, by the observations. Uh, and so that's that that constraining these processes from the observations is an absolutely key task uh, going forward. Um, it also means that things like the total amount of aerosols in the model are vary tremendously by a factor of two, uh, depending on on the different physics that we that we include. And again, it's because we don't have sufficient constraints of enough of things like the aerosol concentration and the aerosol type in the atmosphere to be able to. Uh, pull all the models uh, closer to the observations. So observational uncertainty leads to um, model uncertainty, which leads to model variations uh, in sensitivity and predictions. And I mentioned earlier on that models are not complete, right? So, so while we can do a really good attribution of why global sea level is rising, right? So uh, global sea level is, is, the, is the black line there. Um, and the sum of all the different components is the red line. You can see that the trends and even some of, uh, and even a lot of the noise um, is, is, is being well captured. Uh, and those sum of components, they, they include uh, glacier melt, mountain glaciers, uh, Greenland, Antarctica, uh, water vapor changes, uh, land water changes from, from, ground, from uh, reservoir construction and groundwater depletion all of those things uh, make a difference. So you can see that we understand why global sea level is, is rising. But if you asked a single model uh, of, the, of the class that I'm talking about uh, to do this, uh, what you would find is that um, a lot of these components are not included in the standard models, right? So they don't really have mountain glaciers. They don't really have dynamic uh, changes in Greenland. They don't have dynamic changes in, in Antarctica. And they're not doing a very good job uh, on the total land water because it turns out that groundwater extraction and reservoir construction are hard things to put into a model. So there are questions that we want to ask of these models that they're not yet equipped to, uh, to tell us, right? So, so that's another level of... Um, uh, needed progress uh, in, in these models. But of course, these things are having an impact right now. I mean, this is a picture from uh, Miami in, in, in 2015, but it doesn't, you don't know, need to go particularly far in Miami to find similar pictures from pretty much any year. Um, and you can see that, uh, and it's not just Miami, that the, the, the number of, uh, of flood days per year per, uh, you know, integrated across the coast uh, has been increasing um, exponentially. And, and that exponential increase is what you expect when you have rising sea level um, and then like high tides or, or storm surges uh, on top of that. Uh, and every one of those, uh, you, you, you hit a threshold and basically you've got a, you've got a Gaussian um, uh, distribution. And as you kind of go kind of towards the middle of the Gaussian or the Gaussian kind of moves past the threshold, uh, you, see an, uh, you see a very rapid increase um, in, in flooding. And uh, uh, so we, we know that these are important uh, issues. And if we don't have proper attribution of those regional changes in sea level, uh, we're not going to be able to predict how these things are going to change uh, effectively in the future. We know that extremes are increasing. So uh, this was this was uh, um, uh, a, a case uh, of uh, Siberian temperatures over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's 30 something <laughs> in, in Celsius. Um, uh, that, that was really unprecedented. And, and when you get these unprecedented temperatures uh, in uh, boreal regions, you often get a lot of uh, uh, smoke and wildfire that, that goes with it. And that and that's true in Siberia. It's true in Alaska, it's true in Northern Canada. We are seeing uh, changes in extreme events associated with, uh, this, is, this was Hurricane Harvey, uh, a very extreme precipitation events. Um, uh, and we're seeing increases, uh, this, is, this is wildfire smoke uh, that you can see coming from, uh, from, from British Columbia. Um, th these are uh, elements of the system that we're increasingly finding are uh, being impacted by anthropogenic changes, right? So, so the fact that the planet is warmer, the fact that the atmosphere is wetter, uh, the fact that the soils are drier, all of these things can be tied to 
uh, the changes that that we've imposed uh, on the system, and this is this is a uh, a map of where people have looked at very specific. Um, uh, extreme events and where it's red is where there's been a, a significant um, increase in the intensity or the frequency of that event uh, because of climate change uh, where it's blue uh, there's no detected uh, change um, and so you can see there's a lot of red so we're finding more and more extreme events where we have there's a fingerprint uh, of human uh, influence um, already uh, so we, we need to accelerate the development uh, of these models. Now, the, the way that this works, it's, it's kind of continuous and has been since the since the 19, uh, 1970s. Um, you know, we, we update the, the model inputs, things like the land surface properties, the topography, the emissions, uh, all of these things uh, get updated as, as the technology increases, as our observations get better. Um, we, we develop uh, parameterizations for things that we're not capturing um, robustly. Uh, so this might be uh, associated with cloud formation, uh, rainfall formation, um, uh, uh, heterogeneity in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the land surface. Um, it could be eddies in the ocean. Um, and then uh, we, we put all those things together. We try and tune those models. And I'll give you an example of how we're using machine learning uh, to, to better tune those models. Um, and then we see how well the models do. And when we see problems with those models, uh, we kind of go back and, and, uh, and, and redo this whole this whole. Uh, this whole circle. Uh, but the models, the models, like I said, are, are doing um, increasingly well. Um, uh, but but we still we still go around this loop. So think about how uh, the, the spectrum of machine learning approaches uh, can be used um, in in this uh, in this environment, right? So. Yeah. No. <laughs> Hold on. I should have put my phone on silent. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, apologies about that. Um, the, uh, there are multiple um, uh, ways that we can think about uh, machine learning in this, uh, in this uh, uh, circumstance. Um, uh, one way of, of doing it is to try and use machine learning to estimate parameters in a physical model. Right. So, so that assumes that we know uh, what the basic physics is, but maybe there are some unknown parameters that we would like to find uh, from, uh, from, looking at, uh, from looking at observations or from looking at high resolution models. Um, but that relies on uh, the, the fundamental reasonableness of the existing equations. Our understanding uh, has to be uh, quite well tied to what's, uh, to what's going on. If, if we have a, a very poor parameterization uh, that doesn't include some of the variations uh, that, that, are, that are happening in the real world, uh, then there's no amount of machine learning that's going to fix that uh, for us uh, to get us to a better model. Um, uh, but if you go all the way to like, you know, well, let's just, let's just pretend that we don't know any of the physics and we just, and we have this kind of like, you know, we try and just do deep learning on the basis of the observations uh, themselves, uh, we can often get a very good fit. Uh, but unfortunately, what happens is that when you go out of sample, when you double the amount of carbon dioxide, when you, uh, when you change the continental configuration, all of these things that we think about when we're talking about climate change on, uh, in Earth's history, um, it turns out that these, that these models perform very poorly. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's because uh, it turns out that, that without physics, um, it's very hard to do out of sample um, uh, modeling uh, because because physics is constant, um, uh, but but statistical connections between variables uh, are not right. Um, so let me give you uh, a, a way of doing this that, that is kind of in between those two uh, situations. So um, one of the things that we want to do um, is to tune these models better, right? So uh, what we have in, in this particular case, and I'll, and I'll work and I'll work through this example, um, is uh, we will um, uh, 
uh, take the model, um, and then we're going to explore the sensitivity of the model to, you know, like 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 thirty or forty um, uh, remainingly uncertain parameters, right? So so that's with uh, with forty dimensional uh, phase spaces, um, and we have you know multiple, you know, it could be hundreds of um, target observations that we want the models to uh, to fit. Um, and so what we're going to do here um, is we're not going to do this. Uh, we're, we're not going to uh, do a full uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method uh, with sampling all the different parameters, running the model, and then comparing to the observations. That's that's too that's too expensive. These these models uh, take too long to run uh, for us to be able to do this. So so one year uh, of one of these models uh, takes you know a good fraction of a day, a number of hours. And so if you're going to do you know ten thousand to a million samples, uh, then that, that takes a, a very long time, even if you have um, a lot of these things going concurrently. So, so that's, that's not a, uh, a, a, value, uh, a, a viable approach. Um, but we can use uh, machine learning to develop an emulator. Right, so we sample those parameters. We've we've done it for a uh, for a small number of those things. We train a surrogate model uh, based on that. You know, so that's that's supervised learning, um, and then we use that model surrogate. Uh, and sample it much, much more uh, than we were able to with the full model, and then compare that to observations. Right, so so that is a, is a much lower computational cost, and it allows us to explore. You know, that 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 you know multi dozen um, dimensional phase space in a much more efficient way. Uh, so, uh, so here is a, here's a situation. I think we have um, uh, 45 uh, different parameters. We have 35 different uh, metrics, and and the, the the dots that you're seeing there are how important that parameter is for any one of those uh, particular um, observational metrics. And so you can see that you know where you're seeing very strong colors, uh, those are in in the in the vertical. Those are those are parameters that that can that have a lot of control over the output. Um, where you're seeing uh, you know numbers that, that are kind of more pastely. Then you've got uh, columns that are pastely. Then then it's not a very important parameter. Um, and then where you're seeing like horizontal uh, lines, uh, there you're seeing observational metrics that are very sensitive to uh, the the physics. So so if the observational metric doesn't doesn't change as you change all these things, then it's not sensitive. Uh, if it changes uh, when you change anything, then it is very sensitive. And you can see that there's no there's no one to one correlation between a parameter and an observation, right? That the you know that the, there's a everything is in the mix, everything is an emergent property. And what you find is that it's very hard if you're just looking at this in a manual way uh, to find you know the one or two things that you might want to vary in order to get like one or two things correct. Uh, so you want to have a, uh, a, a much more uh, featured uh, way of finding uh, the minima uh, in, these, uh, in these observational metrics. Uh, but you can do that, um, and uh, while so so what what, I, what I've got here is the observations uh, on the left, um, a kind of previous model version that was hand tuned uh, in the middle, and then uh, the version that was uh, that was uh, tuned using machine learning uh, on the. Uh, uh, on the, on the right, um, and you can see that uh, it's it's not it doesn't suddenly become perfect, right? Because you, you've still got uh, the structure of the physics is basically the same, um, but you are able to remove and to fix, uh, you know, some of the very very large biases that we had. So so you might notice in the uh, in the observational column, there's there's some big uh, there's some big red dots uh, off the coast of uh, South America and off the coast of uh, Namibia and Africa. Uh, those are areas where uh, the model was not producing sufficient marine stratus clouds. Uh, you can also see that off the coast of California. Um, but that's something that uh, the, 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 the tuning uh, allowed us to, uh, to fix um, uh, really uh, quite, quite dramatically. 
Um, and it turns out that the tuning also helped us with extremes. So, so we were talking about the extremes uh, in rainfall, the extremes in, in wildfire. Uh, this is just a, a rainfall histogram. It turns out that our better tuned model that didn't use this as a tuning uh, target uh, was nonetheless much better at doing the tail of the extremes so that the, the distribution of strong rainfall uh, was actually much, much closer to, uh, to what we can detect from satellites than than it was uh, previously. But we, we can't fix everything with machine learning, right? Because, because if we have structural errors in the physics, right? If we, uh, you know, if we just basically have the, 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 uh, the equations wrong, and I'm giving you an example here, which is um, auto conversion, which is the, you know, when you go from cloud to rain, Right, so what's what what happens when you have a you know increasing amounts of uh, of condensate in a cloud? You know when that turns to rain, um, and uh, you know and and you know the parameterizations are generally based on power laws, and so you can see a big red line there uh, that's the, the power law parameterization. Uh, but then uh, you know if we have a, a uh, a, a model that resolves all of these details. Uh, and what you find is that uh, you see this big spread of points, uh, which, are, which are not well captured by a power law parameterization that, that, that was using the, uh, the large scale variables. Um, and in fact, it, it's, it's really quite poor. Um, and so uh, I, machine learning that, like getting, getting a better fit of that power law uh, to the uh, to the distribution, I, it, it's going to be very unclear, um, but it's also like kind of just doing the wrong thing. And, and so machine learning on its own can't help us. We need to also be thinking about the structural, uh, the structure of the physics that we're, we're talking about. And so uh, we need to do both. We need to improve our physics, but we also need to use the machine learning to, to, to check whether the, the physics that we're, uh, that we're improving to um, uh, now allow us to do a better fit. Um, so it turns out that in this particular uh, case, um, uh, treating uh, cloud and rain as two separate things uh, is, is, is really bad. But if you just treat them as being part of the spectrum of condensate uh, within, within, the, uh, within the atmosphere, um, that's actually a much more coherent uh, view of what's going on. Um, and it turns out that then when you parameterize the key things, uh, we can use machine learning to, to find uh, a, uh, a, a, a skillful parameter parameterization, um, because now we have the structure uh, much more closely tied to what's actually going on in the real world. Um, other example uh, here, this is, this, is, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, a couple of folks in my group are working on. Um, uh, what you're trying to do here is, you know, you're, you're using a kind of Bayesian estimation uh, to kind of go from, you know, a prior fit of, in this case, this is cloud microphysics. Um, uh, and then you kind of just kind of uh, incre <laughs> increase the, uh, uh, the iterations to, to get a, a better, uh, more confident posterior and with some uncertainty quantified. And, and that if the, if the physics is sufficiently capable of representing what's actually happening in the real world, this will converge and we'll get a, um, a, a cleaner and more uh, skillful parameterization. Uh, we're doing similar things with vegetation. Uh, we have a lot of observations of vegetation uh, that goes into a demographic model that, that takes into account growth, regeneration, uh, disturbance, um, and, and uh, you know, and soils. Um, and then we can use uh, machine learning to to help tune the parameters of that to get a, a global vegetation structure and, and dynamics, so that we can estimate the impacts of climate change uh, on the vegetation and the impacts of vegetation on, on climate change itself. So we, we've, we've got two real goals here. We're, try, we're trying to improve these models uh, from, the, from, from both the, the, the top down and from the bottom up, right? So the, the, the top down improvements um, are, are using machine learning uh, to kind of short circuit the MCMC um, uh, uh, calculations informed by many, many different kinds of global satellite data and their, and their uncertainties to kind of get a better model for the, the physics that you have. 
that. But then we're also trying uh, to use machine learning to improve the physics and to test whether the physics that we have is suitable enough to model the real world um, in, in, uh, in, in an accurate way. Um, and there's a lot of future work uh, that needs to be done there, um, kind of uniting these two approaches um, and, uh, and, and to kind of really discover uh, what the observations are that we need uh, that are going to allow us to improve process level understanding. Uh, with, the un with, with, with the caveat that those observations may not yet exist. Uh, so the other part of what we do is we're, we're trying to inform the observational campaigns of the future such that uh, we will have the data to allow us to do this uh, going forward. Uh, so my conclusions are basically where we started. Um, I want you to go away with the thought that Earth system models have demonstrated skill and predictions uh, and are continuing to improve. But there are, there are still issues, uh, you know, at the level of the parameterizations and in the inclusion uh, processes. Um, and machine learning is already having a, an impact to improve these things, but on its own, it will not supplant these models um, and uh, uh, all their use in applications, though it may improve uh, how useful they are uh, to, to many different people. Uh, and and it, is, it is true that this is, that this is a tough job. It isn't uh, the case that you can just like take the models, take some observations, throw them all into uh, your favorite uh, machine learning algorithm and get something useful out of it. Uh, the most useful uh, applications that we've seen have required an iteration between the machine learning and our priors uh, and our physics. Uh, such that we end up with, uh, you know, a better and more sophisticated view of, you know, what the, what the priors really are um, and what the physics uh, really should be. Uh, and where that has happened, we have made progress. Uh, but where that hasn't happened, we've ended up with kind of uh, toy applications that, that, that don't really scale or that don't perform well in out-of-sample uh, situations. And I'm just going to give you a, uh, a, 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 a look forward to a LEAP um, a project. Um, so a LEAP is a, uh, uh, is a new project that's just been funded at Columbia University and, uh, and its partners, including, including NASA GIS. Uh, to, uh, this is from, uh, from uh, NSF. Um, and, the, and the whole idea is, is, is to really kind of drill down um, into these kind of physically based machine learning approaches, um, working on those parameterizations, um, working on the parameter inference, um, and then kind of making new uh, products and metrics uh, based on machine learning uh, for things like downscaling that, that Claire mentioned before. Um, and uh, this is of relevance to this audience because uh, Pierre Gentine, um, who's speaking on November 17th, uh, will really kind of get down into the details of what this, uh, what this new activity is going to be uh, funding. And with that, I am happy to uh, go to the discussion part of this, uh, um, this uh, seminar. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, I invite Claire back as well. Thank you. Um, brilliant. No, that was a, was a wonderful talk giving a great overview of the, the state of the art in, in climate modelling at, at NASA and, and more broadly. Um, the, uh, we have a question already uh, in the audience from, from Andrew Williams. Um, and actually, I think this relates quite well to, to um, your closing pitch there, Gavin. So um, do you have any thoughts on the climate project and their development of a new model in Julia? It seems to seems like a good to make good use of new ML techniques, and it would be helpful to have a climate model in a in a modern language. So, uh, Gavin, do you want to take that one first, and then? Um, uh, so, yeah, I've interacted uh, a fair bit with uh, with that with that group. Um, I I'm not super jazzed by the idea of having another model just written in a different language that doesn't really impact anything very much. 
Um, uh, and I think they underestimate what it takes to maintain a model so that you can do uh, things like the CMIP uh, procedures and, and be part of the IPCC. Nonetheless, they are doing some very uh, useful things, um, but the, the useful things are more in the field of you know, developing the uh, machine learned parameterizations um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, and, and kind of building in uh, things like, you know, the, the prior to the, um, to the posterior plus the uncertainty uh, elements within the calculations that they're doing. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wish them all the best of luck uh, with that, but I think they, they, they like just creating a whole new climate model. I think they've probably bitten off more than they can chew, but I'm, you know, I'm, ha I would be super happy uh, to be proved wrong um and uh and i and i look forward to uh, what they're doing uh with great en enthusiasm that's uh no that's great and i think you know it, some of the aspects like you say fit nicely in, in what you you uh, postulated there about using ml to to fill in some of the gaps that maybe we can't do with the physical closures um so those of you who are interested in that project we do have um the talk from tapio schneider uh on on our youtube stream so he gave he gave a talk on this climate project uh, a few weeks ago now just before the summer i think so if you want to go back and, and watch that did you have any thoughts on this this approach claire um so i noticed um somebody in the chat asked about machine learning replacing traditional modeling um so i guess that sort of is is that what clima is trying to do or are they going to be hybrid uh, so i think i mean if I can paraphrase, I mean, so Tepe Schneider and, and others, I think also at, at New York at Columbia with, with Gavin, um, are looking to essentially start from scratch in, in Julia and, and develop a physical um, model that nevertheless is more able to um, ingest and assimilate observations in, a, in an approach, you know, uh, philosophically similar manner to Gavin's, but but because they have the gradients available in Julia, they're able to, um, to optimize some of the, the closures potentially easy, more easily. But I think that's the, uh, as well as high resolution simulations. But, um, so it's, it's kind of hybrid, I think I'd put it in that, that bracket. I'd like to come in with a question, maybe the, to both of you, but it probably starts with Gavin first. But I mean, we're in this weird situation in climate modeling now that we, as you said, Gavin, we have these models that get better and better, but we still know they have fundamental limitations at CMIP type climate models. Um, but we can run them for, for 50,000 years in a CMIP 6 exercise or so. And then we have this new kids on the block, this ultra high resolution climate models that resolve clouds globally on a kilometer scale. And we will hear more talks about that later, but these we can run for a few decades, if at all. But um, what potential do you see to, to sort of use AI, ML to, to combine the strengths of both? Because um, these super high resolution models won't be doing long-term climate forecasts for quite some time. And in a way that's afterwards leads uh, straight to clear, it, it's basically also a downscaling problem uh, or could be related to a downscaling problem, but maybe you want to kick off Kevin. Uh, sure. So, um, you know, I think we, we learn a lot from these exercises in high resolution. But, but as you say, you know, like I can run a cloud resolving model uh, over the atmosphere, but, I, but I'm not including the ocean. I'm not including the, uh, the ice sheets. I can't really deal with radiative forcing. Like, I, you know, it, it's they, they, they give us, you know, views down a different part of uh, phase space. Um, and I think that we, we can use them. And one of the arguments for doing these high resolution models um, over time, and, and this has been going on, you know, for many decades. I mean, I, my PhD, uh, this is 25 years ago, uh, was part of a, a project to do high resolution modeling of the of the Southern Ocean. Um, uh, and, you know, and it produced uh, wonderful, uh, you know, beautiful swirly uh, animations and maps and, and, and the likes. Um, uh, and, and one of the arguments has always been that we could use those high resolution models to inform the lower resolution models that you would then run for, for longer. Uh, and and it, it's an odd thing, but, but it, it, it rarely happens. Um, and, and I think that 
uh, the rarity of that is notable, right? So, so why have we not been able to use all the previous high resolution versions to inform the lower resolution versions? Because we're still using the lower resolution versions, right? Where, 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 where why have we not been able to do that? Um, and I, and I think that one of the things is that it was just very complicated, um, and that there weren't clear patterns. Uh, and it wasn't something that we could just look at, draw a line and say, oh, well, you know, we can tune this parameterization to this high resolution data using that as a surrogate for, uh, for observations. Uh, but I think that the approaches that people are taking uh, these days, um, and, and when I say these days, I really mean like in the last five years, um, I think have the potential to use that set of data, th th those high resolution simulations, both of the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, uh, they can use that uh, more intelligently than we were able to use it before. Um, and so, you know, so Bjorn Stevens is going to come along with his with his global cloud resolving model and you say, oh, my gosh, this is so wonderful. Um, uh, but on its own, it isn't going to give us the answer before we need the answer, right? So, I mean, I, I did an extrapolation once and I try to work out, you know, if you, if you wanted to do everything from first principles without any parameterizations, uh, at the rate of change of, of computation, assuming that it stays the same, um, it, it would take us to 2100 before we could run that. Um, uh, and, and we really want to know what's going to happen in 2100 before we get there. <laughs> so, so, so uh, you know, we're, we're, all, we're going to be needing to improve the lower resolution models for a very long time. I think we can. Uh, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I have not quite faith, but, but I, have, I, I, I have an instinct that we will be able to do that better with this latest generation uh, with the latest um, machine learning techniques and with the latest understanding of the physics uh, to, to be able to do that more effectively. Uh, but it remains a challenge and, uh, and, I'd, and I'd really like to see more people focused uh, on that exact issue. That's, that's, Great. that's very good. Do you want to pick this up from a, from a downscaling perspective? I guess, I mean, the one big problem in this is we're talking about petabytes of data per day as an output of some global cloud resolving model, which obviously poses challenge to machine learning techniques, I guess. I think we lost your sound, Claire. You're muted. Not, not more than what you said that it could be a downscaling problem, um, but maybe some other jumping off points. I had some comments and reactions to Gavin's talk. It was great. I took some, some photos and may, bug you for some of those figures in the future. But, um, and I liked what you said is that um, you need physics to do out of sampling modeling or basically um, it's without physics, it's hard to do out of sampling modeling. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then you also said, but ML cannot help if the physics in the model is somehow biased. I would argue, um, if we add some observation data, AI can do or ML can do a better job of, of sort of learning the model bias. So linking, like learning a data-driven model that links between the physics-driven model and pulls it back to observations, whether you learn the model bias in a baked-in fashion and never even have to see it in your end-to-end -end model or do so explicitly for model calibration. Yeah, no, that, that's 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 a that's a very good point. I should I should have uh, I should have included that as as a case. Yeah, thanks. I wonder. I mean, um, the downscaling task that you uh, you outlined, Claire, I think it's a really really cool application. I, I still need to go away and read this uh, the, about these aligning these flows. Um, is that something that could scale to to these global cloud resolving simulations? I mean, could we run it? Uh, for one kilometer um, atmospheric simulations over the whole globe, and and kind of you know learn about the extremes and variability that we that we see at those resolutions from GCM simulations, and is there something we can learn from this latent space that you model about the relationship between these simulations that you know something physical that we can interpret? So um, the first question is about feasibility and. Um, you know, the bottleneck is going to be 
training. Um, so, you know, we might have to appeal to places that have web scale compute, be it some of these big um, consortium projects or industry. Mm -hmm. um, that said, once you've got the model trained, if you wanted to use it sort of as a, a post-processing or something to go uh, to do your downscaling between models, that, that should be pretty um, feasible and efficient. Um, or the other thing you could do is sort of continuous fine tuning where you can right. learn the model on the data that you can <laughs> fit in, in your memory and then um, continuously update it in sort of an online fashion. Um, your second question gets potentially almost philosophical. It's interesting um, around interpretability of the latent space. And this is an issue not just in, in this domain, but in, um, in AI more generally. Um, so this is a, a sort of probabilistic model because you've got after training on data, you've got a posterior distribution learned over your latent space. Um, and this gets into even how do we interpret enough to know how to interpolate between two points in the latent space? Um, and you know, in AI, there's, you know, ideally we want to walk a geodesic on the actual learned posterior, which yep. could be highly complex that becomes a compute issue. So you have similar sort of optimization strategies where you'll, you'll take a step along a gradient <laughs> and then project back, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I do get asked this question all the time and it might be fertile ground for sitting down with domain experts and, try to, and trying to interpret that um, latent space for any you know, particular domain on which you would train. Mm. I don't have any scientific answer beyond that, but I, I do think it's a rich area. Fantastic, that's a perfectly good answer. Um, and brings us nicely to time. So I think we'll probably take that as opportunity to wrap up. Um, thank you again, both to Claire and Gavin for a really nice pair of talks and hopefully some inspiration for, for everyone watching. Um, Do you have any final remarks, Philip? No, thanks again to both uh, speakers, fantastic talks. And, and please tune in again next week. So we bring in a little bit of an industry uh, uh, perspective on the problem with Alison uh, Lowndes and, and David Holt from NVIDIA, who will give us a perspective yeah, from, from a non-academic sector on the same question. Um, so tune in again, please. Thank you very much. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector.